Okay. So, uh, Eric, you want to lead off any questions, or shall we read just a bunch of them? What should we do? Um, yeah, sure. Do you guys have any questions? Anybody have questions? Based on what we've been talking about, either Eric or me. Think for a minute. If you have a question. Yes. So I was just wondering in terms of what you talked about this afternoon and thank you. Um, and you're talking about mathematicians and and and, can, and modern uh, scientific and how like the materialistic world yes and trying to find the ultimate reality within a ma materialistic mind frame right so, I wonder to which extent actually like it, it seems that these are very useful tools to understand the reality right like mm -hmm. relative reality uh -huh. and it's only at a moment where they can't find anything anymore that then the mind can go into ultimate reality. But to which extent do you think that there's going to be a moment where the materialistic mindset might see the possibility of an ultimate reality within the, 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 the framework that is being created? Because in, in a sense to me, it seems that it could be that it's the first step of trying to find real reality. The materialistic way. Yeah. <clears throat> well, well, yes and no. Like, like any good thing, I think yes and no. Uh, I think that uh, actually that to go through the mind is more direct. So that's the no. And uh, it's more direct because sort of the, it's like, this is like, the, there's a famous verse of Shantideva talking about tolerance, you know, patience and tolerance, where he says, if you don't like walking on the earth with all the sharp stones and thorns and different things, because it hurts your foot, you have two choices. One is you can cover the earth with leather, the entire earth, and then walk on suede, <laughs> I was thinking of a softball or a baseball or a basketball, <laughs> planet basketball, you know. Or you can make yourself a pair of sandals, you know, and have like a, a, a surface under your foot that protects you from the sharp things. So the analogy of that is, you know, the, if the mind is well regulated and well understood, the reality of the mind, and you are, you can more manage your mind then whether the outer world is well regulated or not is not irrelevant but you can re you can deal with different situations you know even if the outer world is not perfectly regulated so it's more practical to go through the mind and i think similarly in seeking the nature of reality the indians made the decision like on the basis like of that sandal analogy that each of us, <clears throat> of, of the realities that we confront, our internal reality is the most immediate one to us. And therefore, if we can understand through that reality, instead of living in denial of it, then we have, the, it's like the closest we can get to it. The materialistic one is kind of a huge detour where we sort of distract ourselves from dealing with ourselves by saying, well, let's understand how the oceans flow, and how the stars turn, and how the, you know, et cetera, et cetera, you know, like all kinds of external things. And we, if we can get control of all of those things, then we'll have a really great scene here. You know? Meanwhile, we are emotional basket cases here. No matter how the scene is, it's not, we're not that happy in it, A. And B, a quantitative way of trying to understand reality, of course, is because reality is infinite, will never end. So there's also the basis, you know, the, there's a basis in, um, in materialistic science. There's a basic presupposition that no one can actually understand reality. And, uh, and even there's the delusion that the material reality is the ultimate reality. And it's just a matter of therefore measuring it. And they're, so they're not looking through it, so to speak, you know, kind of, I, I would say. You know. 
And uh, <clears throat> is the fantastic technologies that the West has developed from the Greek root, supposedly, although, for example, decimal system came from India. It did not come from either the Arabs or the Greeks, or the, or the Romans, but from India. Uh, is all this fantastic technology, is it really that useful? That's also another question. I, d I mean, I don't know if you were saying that, but you mentioned something useful. But uh, is it, or is it actually ultimately simply magnifying the imbalances in our mind to this incredible self-destructive degree? For example, the mind has hatred. Like one lama I know, we think of a formula for a nuclear weapon, you know, like uh, of which there are what, 10,000 of them that could destroy the planet like 500 times over, already triggered if Mr. Putin has a bad digestion or something, or Mr. Bush or some one of these morons. And we would think the formula for that is, you know, you have the trigger mechanism and some plutonium and then it goes out and then it ignites the, 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 the uranium-235, blah, blah, blah. And we think of it as a physical formula that makes it, you know, and then there's some machining of parts and, and they're in containers and things. But a Tibetan Lama would, once said to me, that the key ingredient of the nuclear weapon is hatred in the mind of the inventor and hatred in the mind of the user. Because the trigger mechanism is the hatred in the human mind, for example. So in our normal human mind that is afflicted with hatred and wants to destroy somebody, in the previously, they would have to get a sword, train in martial arts, go out and start hacking. You know, and like be needs to be a better swordsman than the other one. You know, at least they, they have to kind of do it with their body. Whereas in this case, the mental hatred can be so magnified by that technology that you could destroy hundreds of thousands, or you could destroy the entire planet. Actually, right? All life on Earth could be destroyed by a nuclear winter. That'd be the end of this planet, right? It's like it. if they detonated even one tenth of those weapons. You follow? Me? So while it's you, I, I, I enjoy driving a car. I, you know, I have like this and that gadget in the house. They are convenient, but um, maybe they are a little bit distracting too. I've had a nice time. I remember when we were when we were younger, we were with two of our children and one baby. We were in India in seventy. We were in a place with no electricity, no water, no running water. We had to buy water from somebody, or we had to walk ourselves to a well some distance. And, you know, if we did one thing in a day, we thought we'd accomplish a lot. <laughs> like read one chapter of something, or, you know, and they had to finish before the sun went down because the candlelight was so irritating to read in. And then, then we went to bed at a reasonable time, got up at the dawn. You know. Actually, when we got into the rhythm of that, it was very, very pleasant, in fact. And, uh, I was very proud of the Dalai Lama, for example, in his book, Ethics for the New Millennium, where he said that I, which he wrote in 1999, and he said, um, I used to think that this whole, this modern technology, and he's a modern technology bug, Dalai Lama said. He used to take watches apart when he was a little kid in Tibet. He got some car that some people had brought the parts over the mountains, and was there in Lhasa on the few roads that they were. Uh, and try to fix it up, and whatever. And uh, <clears throat> so he's a big thing, but he said, I used to think that all these developed countries, they were quite marvelous, and that they had lessened, and all this science and technology, material science and technology, had lessened the degree of human suffering. He said. But then, then he told a story about how he was in a wealthy house in England, and you know, he was a house guest there at some point. And uh, very nice people, and having a nice time visiting them, and he was out giving some teaching somewhere. And then he said he's a natural snoop, which I know is a fact, <laughs> because he was visiting my house in Amherst, and he came on short notice, so we had had time to really clean, so we threw a lot of stuff in different closets. <laughs> and then one time, he opened one of those closets as he was walking through between one room to another, as he was getting a tour of the house. And all this stuff all fell out. <laughs> and he went, oh, I'm tiny, I'm tiny. <laughs> he was having his Indian accent. It was like 81, 84, something. 84, I think. 
in Amherst, but Amherst went through. I was like, oh, I'm dying. He was so thrilled. He was excited. Anyway, it was good. It was Snoop. He said, it's Howard. And then he opened the medicine cabinet in the bathroom, because I guess they gave him the master bedroom or something. It was a sign of respect to the owners of the house. And uh, he was shocked by all the tranquilizers and the Prozac and the all the anxiety, you know, antidepressants, and like the quantities of them in the, in the medicine cabinet of these, you know, should be comfortable, happy people. You know? mm -hmm. And then finally, he said he decided that the main thing about the modern technology was more fancy houses with lots of cars and a lot of people driving back and forth between them. Mm -hmm. But then.